Hello and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we talk about the situation of the suffering church around the world. Today, it is my very great privilege to be speaking with Father Theodore Mascarenas, a pillar father and responsible for the departments of Asia, Africa and Oceania at the Pontifical Council for Culture in Rome. Father Mascarenas is also a professor at the Gregoriana University in Rome, the St. Thomas University in Rome, as well as the Pilar University in Goa, India, his homeland. Father Mascarenas, thank you for being with us here today in our program. Thank you very much. Father, you come from a very devout Catholic family. You are one of four, of which two became priests. Can you tell us, how do you think that this devotion in your family prepared you for the role that you carry today? Uh, I think, first and foremost, I am grateful to my mother, her deep spirituality. She's 82 years today. Uh, when I still go home, she has to interrupt her rosary to talk to me. Oh, very good. So that's, that's what uh, we, we grew up in an atmosphere that sort of breathed God. And uh, every morning, if we were in holidays, she would wake us up, take us to Mass, and then the rest of the day would begin. And Mass is in Goa normally at 6.30 in the morning. So for, a young, for a young fellow, it's an effort. Yeah, at the age of five, six. But uh, that's where I think our spirituality began to grow. The second thing that she put into our minds, into our hearts, is that no sacrifice is big enough for God. And if God calls you, go. Uh, in fact, my third brother also wanted to be a priest. Uh, but then I think he himself realized that somebody had to look after my mother or whatever, because both of us had become missionaries. So. So that, I think that's that deep breathing spirit which only parents can put into their children. Nobody else can. And that is why I always, when I speak to parents in the parishes, I tell them, it is you who can really put the love of God into the hearts of your children. Goa, of course, was one corner of India evangelized by the Portuguese, implanting a deep faith into the culture of Goa. You are now working at the Pontifical Council for Culture. How do you carry this culture of religion, this culture of faith with you now into your, in, and the love of culture, I suppose, with you into your new work? It's very interesting because when I came down to Rome for the first time, I came with big ideas of a holy city where everybody would be praying and everybody would be filled with faith. And then I saw the church is practically empty except for feasts. I once went to the Feast of St. Francis Xavier at uh, Chiesa di Gesù, where the hand is kept, where the body is in Goa. And I thought there would be, the church would be packed like, it would, like it's in Goa. And I found about 10 people for one of the masses there on a feast day. Uh, so it came to me as a big surprise. Uh, and then I think I should sum up what an Italian told me. We brought the faith to you, now you bring it back to us. And I think that seems to be the state, uh, the, the way things seem to be going today. Which brings me to my question, the question of globalization, secularization. I want to talk about this with you in this interview today, about the impact of these two forces that are coming on developing countries like India, Asia, Oceania, all the areas, in fact, of which, for which you are responsible. Um, globalization, let's talk about the good things. What are the, good ben what are the benefits of globalization? In another interview, another talk, I once said the church was the first globalizer. <laughs> and uh, in that sense, I think uh, when faith is globalized, it's a big boon, it's a big gift. Uh, say a few years ago, uh, the church could not give so much of its message as it can today because there's television, there's communication. And one of the positive things, I think, is first of all, it brought uh, the consciousness of the dignity of the human person. 
that people can't continue to live in misery, that development was necessary, that people had to be uplifted, uh, inequalities had to be taken off. And I think this has been a great boon to India especially, where the Western progress came in, life became easier, especially for the housewives, uh, people with seven, eight children suddenly find a washing machine and things become so easy for them. <laughs> uh, so those are the benefits that came up. But with the benefits, um, as it is said, with the, the wind that blew, a lot of uh, good things came in, but a lot of germs also came in. Yes, I wanted to, you wrote once that globalization had many benefits, but it was also a great leveler. What did yeah. you mean by a great leveler? When I say it was a great leveler, I rather meant it a, a bit in the positive sense and a bit in the negative sense. It's a great leveler because at one time, Indian cultures, Asian cultures were not known at all. With globalization, there has been an exchange and uh, people have come to know the value of Indian culture. So in that sense, culturally, there, there is a leveling taking place. People no longer look at our countries as third world countries, as countries that are in the dumps, but they look with respect. In that sense, it's a great level up. But on the negative side, I think, what actually happened was in, um, the, the values uh, that were preserved in India have been sort of beheaded. So that's another sort of leveling that we don't, don't want and don't like. I would like to, I think perhaps at the core, if you will, of the challenge of globalization is secularization. That is that uh, Western cultural values are not only being transmitted uh, through economy and finance, but also uh, secular values are being exported, if not imposed on uh, nations like India. Um, what threat do you see um, of this secularization for nations like India? I think the secularization works today not so much as colonization. I, I jokingly call uh, McDonaldization and coca colonization, I used to call it some time back. But even that is gone in, sense, in the sense food was one leveler in a certain sense. McDonald's and uh, coca cola came in, certain, took away certain you know, basic elementary traditions of India. But I think we have moved on to a higher level now of, uh, of this uh, secularization taking place. And this is uh, whatever the United Nations thinks of itself, and it's dominated by the Western cultures because of the money, muscle, whatever they have. Uh, how can abortion, euthanasia, um, certain uh, homosexuality, how can this be promoted as state uh, promotional subjects? I want to touch upon this because this imposition on the fabric of India is having enormous, uh, creating enormous damage. And I want to know from you, from the perspective of culture, let's take the topic of abortion, for example. Abortion was introduced in the 1950s, I believe, in 1960s. 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 Uh, and presently, approximately 11 million abortions are carried out every year in India. Um, and yet, Jainism, Buddhism, uh, and the other traditional religions, not speaking of Christianity, um, and Hinduism, of course, consider uh, life to be sacred, and, and uh, violence, particularly against the family, is abhorred. What uh, are we pulling apart the threads of the fabric of society uh, and what is the risk that we confront um, for cultures like India? The irony of the situation is that spirituality allows exactly that spirituality prohibits. <laughs> I'll explain. What happened in the 1960s, 70s, there was a big outcry that India's population was growing at too fast a rate for comfort. There was a fear of a population There was a bomb. fear of population explosion to the extent that in 1975, during the emergency period, the famous dark ages of Indian democracy, uh, the Prime Minister imposed a compulsory sterilization after you had two children. And then, then the beauty of the whole thing is that the Indian population threw her out. They voted against her, so it's not the will of the population. But what has happened is this. While all the 
the Indian culture do hold life sacred. I feel underlying the whole Indian culture, wealth and prosperity is also a very, very big value. So much so we have gods of prosperity, gods of wealth. When you have a chance to choose between the two, what do you choose? The 11 million abortions a year is a sort of a choice. I choose wealth and prosperity and therefore to have it, I don't mind killing an unborn baby. Now, now this is the real problem. Second problem is the problem of the girl child. Gender selection. Yeah. I hope and wish the government had thought of the girl child before allowing abortion. Today everybody is shouting, social activists are shouting that the girl child is being, the only way to save the girl child is ban abortion totally. If you ban to, uh, abortion totally, you can't have selective killings. This, this is worse than what Hitler had been doing. And, and here, there it was, it was ruled by one man, here everybody makes a decision. And the whole philosophy, euthanasia, abortion is my own decision, is not right. Because the unborn one does not have a voice, does not mean he or she does not have a life. I think in our discussion we are touching on the question of abortion, uh, the de humanization, the removal of the value of the human person. And this is not only at the beginning of life, but it's also at the end of life. Uh, for example, recently the legislature in Kerala introduced a motion to allow euthanasia and assisted suicide. And you spoke out quite strongly condemning this, uh, this new position. Is this another sign of the road that we're on our way? I think when a human being starts taking decisions that are gods, I think we have reached the Tower of Babel, hmm. that they wanted to go up to God. We are just the stewards of our lives, we are not the owners. And I think that has to be remembered. And that is where we will bring the dehumanizing effects. Because once we start considering life not to be to the highest priority, then any killing will be justified in some way or the other. Yes. I think the, the, the danger has been we've moved from an understanding of, of life inherently sacred and important because it's life to a quality of life. And as we've entered into the question of the quality of life, of course, everything then becomes possible. Yeah, everything becomes possible. See, um, I think what is happening with the globalization, with the Western values coming in, but they are mingling also with values already existing. They were underlying. Um, there is a certain selfishness in every human being. And in that selfishness, we try to see what is best for us, what is best for our children. Not everything is done uh, with an evil mind. Everybody is saying what is best for us. But in choosing that best, the hierarchy of values is lost. Is material benefit the best or is there a life higher than material life? Until we come back to making sacrifices and I think until that element of sacrifice, that inclination to sacrifice, that I will be a little more rigid with myself and give more to others, I think no crisis in society will be solved. Yes. I want to change the chapter now, I want to talk about your present work, about the Pontifical Council for Culture. Pope John Paul II, blessed Pope John Paul II, instituted the Pontifical Council for Culture in 1982, and upon doing so, he drew upon the words of Pope Paul VI, and I would like to quote these words because I find them prophetic. Pope Paul VI stated, uh, underscoring the tragedy for culture, which is undergoing a deep crisis because of the rupture with the faith. Now this was Pope Paul VI. Uh, uh, was his voice prophetic in anticipating the coming challenge? And uh, did he already see secularization on the horizon? That's a very interesting question because I think uh, the Second Vatican Council, and this uh, follows in his document that follows, uh, he had a big uh, 
a synod for evangelization and uh, bishops from all over had come after the Vatican II. And he wrote this uh, document, Evangelii Nunciandi, immediately after that, uh, showing what was the need for evangelization of cultures. That's where he speaks about evangelization of cultures. What he had noticed already in the 1960s, uh, where already the West was waking up to this uh, rupture between faith and, um, and uh, cultures, uh, was that a lot of people who had suddenly, all of a sudden, 1968, the famous year here in the West, uh, they had noticed that maybe God is not necessary for us. <laughs> so in, in the sense, they had begun questioning. A certain atheism had started seeping into society. Moreover, uh, man's activities were no longer being guided by faith. And the rupture was becoming was beginning and um, Paul the sixth uh, I consider one of the big saints uh, big popes of the century uh, foresaw this that should the rupture go further and further away and should God be taken out cultures would not exist cultures couldn't subsist Pope John Paul II precisely in this line created the Pontifical Council in order to resynthesize faith and culture. And I would like to quote from Blessed Pope John Paul II. He called upon the, uh, upon the Council to help the Church achieve a new synthesis of faith and culture for the greatest benefit of all. How do you understand this mandate for you? John Paul uh, II, another great Pope, was coming with a huge cult cultural preparation. He was a man who was, uh, he had worked, uh, acted as an actor, he wrote poems, and he knew how faith could actually inspire culture. And he was, he was convinced of this. And that's how he founded a council, which according to him, could bring faith and culture together. And there were two brilliant ideas, uh, which he sort of uh, invented, depending on the on Evangelii Nunciandi uh, 1920. Uh, his idea was this, that if cultures could be evangelized, like the incarnation, if an evangelization of cultures meant uh, every culture has its good points because we are made in the image and likeness of man, but it also has its defect because unfortunately we sinned. So he thought and he believed that getting God into the culture, we could take off the defects and reinforce the positive values of cultures. And therefore, for him, evangelization of cultures and inculturation of the faith were two very strong points which he handed over to the council to take over. Now you carry part of that responsibility with your work in, in these areas of Asia, Africa and Oceania. And you stated in an interview, I'm going to flood you with quotes here, it is not here superficial touches that are needed, but a deep-rooted value system that forms the ethos of our country that should be preserved. How you've imbued this idea of Pope John Paul II, it's a deep-rooted cultural uh, understanding that we need to that we need to achieve. Can you explain a bit more about that? Actually, India, my country, is a very beautiful country, especially culturally. It's uh, more than 3,000 years of cultural history. And what I see is India has beautiful traditional values of family, community, sacredness of life. Uh, so in that sense, uh, there are a number of positive things. But India has also had it's fallen nature, as I would say. We have had, you would know, we have had the sati, one of the um, customs of India. When the husband died, the wife had to jump into the fire, which was taken away some years ago uh, by the British, of course, in the 19th century. Uh, we have this big problem of, uh, of the girl child simply being aborted. So we also have our big problems, uh, our caste system, our regional system. Now, when we want to transform this society, 
is not a simple superficial thing that has to be attempted or is being attempted. There are many superficial things being attempted. For example, <clears throat> we have 27 percent reservation for the lower caste. But the lower caste continue to be lower caste. How so, do you mean 27 percent so We have 27 percent seats reserved in education institution, government jobs by a law. But exactly that law continues to promote the caste system. It's a, super, it's a means, it's a superficial means, it's necessary. I'm not against it and I support it fully. But unless there is an internal conviction in every Indian that everybody is equal, that nobody is lower and nobody is higher. These structures will continue structures to be necessary. Yes. For the transformation of structures, there has to be transformation of the heart. And therefore, that is why I said it is not a superficial change that we are seeking. It's a deep transformation of human hearts. Human society can be changed if human hearts can be changed. But this presupposes if we're talking about culture, because Indian Catholics, of course, number very few in the total picture of Indian society, this presupposes an enormous question of dialogue, of, of working with those other uh, societal, cultural, religious elements in Indian society to achieve this goal. So where, my question, do you meet uh, where do you meet all of these different elements? What is the common language of understanding? You know, I always give the example of the Samaritan woman at the well as an example of dialogue. Jesus begins with simple material things. Give me some water to drink. And that's how the dialogue starts. And not only that, but he was a Jew. With speak, a Samaritan. Exactly. And, but normally they shouldn't even have been yeah, communicating. And so this is in yeah. question so the of this dialogue. Way, he, the only he way he the... could start a conversation was by asking for water. Because being a Jew, he couldn't start any dialogue except for some material need. And that's where he starts. And then it moves from level to level. He asks about a personal life, the next question. And then he promises a eternal water. Eventually she becomes the missionary who goes and brings other people. In a certain sense, I find this as the model for India. We start a dialogue with people on the basic necessities of life. How we can work together to improve people's lives. But it should not stop there. Because our values should be exchanged. Whatever is good and respectable in the other values have to be, has to be taken by us and whatever we have has to be taken by them. An open, frank, reciprocal dialogue as Pope Benedict calls it is the only way to grow together. Yes, but does, uh, um, does not this change require evangelization? Uh, does not this cultural movement, as you say, require evangelization of the and how do we get there? I don't see any difficulty with evangelization because what does evangelization mean? Evangelization means we proclaim Jesus Christ and his message. We must distinguish between evangelization and conversion. Evangelization is proclaiming. If people want to convert, that's God's work. So we evangelize. It's our duty and it's our right to proclaim Jesus Christ, his values. Once those values seep into somebody's heart and into society, it is then that they will ask for baptism or conversion. Once Mahatma Gandhi, uh, known affectionately as the father of India, was asked, what is the greatest hindrance to Christianity in India? And Mahatma Gandhi answered, Christians. Um, where is it that uh, we as Christians are falling down and not carrying our responsibility in this question of evangelization, in this question of renewal of culture? It's a bit historical, it's a bit present, the answer. Uh, I'll give you another quote of Mahatma Gandhi which would fit much better. He said, I like Christ but I do not like Christians because they are so unlike Christ. Very good. I think that is the answer. 
what has happened to Christians, unfortunately, as everywhere, they have lived Christ only in part. There are big, big defects in the Christian community that need to be corrected. For example, the caste system, which is unchristian, is still being practiced. The right system, the rights, the fight between rights, the Latin right and the serum are both Catholics, is a problem for the non-Christian. Your whole, the very, very often, the arrogance that we show to others. So until I think the Christians become like Christ in the real sense of the term, it will be a hindrance to many people to become Christians. Father Mascarenas, thank you for being with us here today in our program. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today on Where God Weeps. And if you'd like to know more about the work of the Pontifical Council and perhaps how you might be able to help the situation of Catholics in India to support materially or spiritually, to pray for them, please look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.